I think we've all had this experience. A little voice inside you says, don't criticize your colleague to others. But the comment slips out before you can barely do anything about it. He's not very consistent, is he? The little voice is activated by the Spirit of our Creator. And our Creator is really saying, don't you try to put others right by your criticism. My Spirit has the specific task of convicting the world of sin. He will do it. You just keep quiet. But we, of course, reject that voice and we decide, no, we'll put them right. And the way we do it is we criticize them behind the hand to somebody else. Now, that's sin. That's sin. That is sin. That's trying to do something that God wants to do, but you take it over and you do it yourself. And you do it without his power or without his strength. Now that is sin, loved ones. Or you've had a, just a wretched day. It's just been a constant strain in that office just been a grind the whole day at work. And beyond that, you're beginning to get anxious about the finances. And you come home and you're just worn out. And you reach for the martini, or you reach for the tranquilizer, or you reach for the cigarette. And a little voice within you says, I have power to give you peace and quiet at this moment if you'll just stop doing what you're doing and look to me. And that little voice even says, you're not solving the problem. You're only trying to suppress the symptoms of a wrong attitude to the problem that is in you. And the little voice says, look, there's a greater, more powerful life that I can give you to enable you to get over this if you'll just sit back in the chair and look to me for a moment or two. But we decide no, so we pour the martini, we swallow the pill, we drag the old nicotine in to dull the nerve endings. That's sin. It's not because it's smoking. It's not because it's drinking. That's dumb. Those things in themselves probably are all right. They're not wrong. But it's using them to try to find an answer to the worry and anxiety that comes from not trusting your loving Father in heaven. That's the sin of it. It's trying to live life and face life's problems without God. Not taking every opportunity to trust him and lean into him, you in fact find other material things to act as a substitute for his undergirding love and assurance. So really what you're doing is getting used to living without God in both those situations. You want a car, a coat, an armchair, some shoes that you've just seen in a sale, a motorbike that you've been wanting for so long. The little voice says within you, God first and others first, then yourself. But you feel, if I don't get it now, I'll never get it. 
And so you buy the coat, you buy the car, you buy whatever it is. Now, rejecting that little voice of conscience and deciding, I'm going to do it, I'm going to get what I want, when I want, that's sin, loved ones. That's sin. That's living apart from your Maker. That's living without His directions operating in your life. That's normalizing life as if there's no God, as if there's no loving Father who thinks about you and takes care of you. That's what sin is. Now, even those examples show us all, because I don't know, is there any of us who haven't done that? You know, it doesn't need to be the martini or the tranquilizer. It's something else. It's turning on the television or something to drown out the worry. But probably none of us here, there isn't one of us who has not experienced that in some form. Now, loved ones, that's what sin is. Sin is not all this business of Lee Harvey Oswald. Sin is not all this business of the mafia and the boys on the East Coast. Sin is not all that kind of stuff. I'm sure that's the outworkings of sin. But sin itself is a very, very simple independence of God. And not treating him as your loving father. And not dealing with everything in life with his power and his strength. But in attempting to meet it on your own, by your own power, with your own lesser methods and substitutes. And most of us find that this has become such an automatic reaction in our own lives that we actually have got used to calling this our sinful natures. Really, it's so automatic that we almost say, this is just natural. This is the way we go, sure. I take a martini, that isn't that the way you deal with worry? That's the way you lighten it up and look forward to a reasonable kind of evening where you can at least think clearly. So we say. But we say, yeah, that's the way to go. And so many of us have got so used to this that it's really a natural thing to us. And we call it our sinful natures. Uh, God calls it in Romans 6, the body of sin. He says it's a body of sin. That is, the body has got used to being used by this power of independent life to find in the world the substitutes for God's power that it needs. So the body is the servant of sin. It brings in a martini through the old mouth to affect the emotions. Or it brings a pill in to affect the emotions. Or it brings the nicotine through the lungs to affect the nerve endings. But the body is being used by this independent life that wants to exist apart from God and without God's help. And this has become so automatic in many of us that we really just call it the sinful nature. It is actually a dreadful perversion that has taken place in our personalities. Our personalities have got used to operating this way that they cannot work any other way. And so it's become an unnatural thing for people when they are worried to immediately turn their eyes to God. It's become the natural thing to turn to something that will dull the worry. It's become the unnatural thing for people when they're in financial troubles to turn up to the Father and hand the whole thing over to Him. It's been the, become the natural thing that you go to Thorpe Finances or whoever else may be the uh, human answer. And so the thing has become so automatic and natural that it is a perversion in our personalities. Our personalities have become reversed. Instead of taking from God and giving to the world, we take from the world and we try to give to ourselves. And so there is this streak of perversity or irrationality that we cannot deal with. Now, loved ones, transcendental meditation makes not one dent on that tendency. It doesn't make a dent in that personality that has become reversed. Church-going habits cannot affect it. They cannot change that basic way your personality works that is perversion. It cannot change it. You still find yourself reaching for the old martini, reaching for the old pill, reaching for the cigarette. No church-going habits can change it. No Eastern religion can change it. Eastern religion can bring a kind of passivity into your psychological apparatus. But it can do nothing to change that radical perversion that has taken place in your personality that makes you operate as if there's no God. 
power of positive thinking can't affect that reversal at all that has taken place. In fact, there is no religion or no psychological technique that can deal with that basic reversal and basic perversion that has been handed down to us over the years by forefathers who have lived for centuries as if there's no God. And that's what most of us are left with. Now, loved ones, that's the point of Calvary. When Jesus died 1,900 years ago, God included your perverted, reversed, carnal, self-centered, independent personality in him, destroyed it there, so that a new one can be created by the power of his Holy Spirit in you. And you need nothing less than that. Honestly, loved ones, if you're struggling with some of the things that I struggled with, you need nothing less than a new personality. You need a completely new being because your old one works the wrong way and it doesn't matter how you train it, you can't get it to work the right way. The only solution is the solution that our Creator has found. He has put it into His Son on Calvary in a supraspatial, supratemporal miracle and He has destroyed it there and through the power of His own life called the Holy Spirit, He is able to recreate a new personality in you. Now that's what Calvary is all about. Now, loved ones, if you want to look at that, you, you can find it in several uh, scriptural verses. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. It's page 1006. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, Jesus did not have this kind of perverted personality. You see. His personality worked the right way. He automatically trusted his father. He didn't have that kind of personality. It wasn't because of his own personality that he had to die. But God made him your personality. He made, took the worst that you can do nothing to change and he put it into a son and he destroyed it there. That's what it means. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. So he put your personality into a son and destroyed it there. And you see why. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then verses 14 and 15 of that same chapter. For the love of Christ controls us because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. All of us died when Jesus died. And he died for all that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And that's why he died, so that we'd no longer live for ourselves. Now that's what the love of Christ is, loved ones. The love of Christ is not involved in reinforcing that desire to do what we want to do that we call carnal self-confidence. That's what carnal self-confidence is. Trying to get from the world and other people what you really should be receiving from God. That's carnal self-confidence. Now, Jesus' love is not involved in reinforcing that carnal self-confidence. The love of Christ is found in that he's taking that carnal self-confidence of ours that will eventually drive us into hell and will drive us away from God completely and he's destroying it in himself. That's the love of Christ. The love of Christ is that he's lovingly trying to draw us onto the cross with himself and get us to allow him to destroy that self-confidence that wants to do with the martini, do with the aspirin, do with the cigarette, do with the television, what God himself wants to do for us. You have a loving father. He wants you to turn to him and share your troubles with him and put your trust in him and begin to depend on him to sort things out in your life. These other methods are just declaring your rejection of that. That's why the Bible says about that mind of the flesh, it's enmity against God. It isn't subject to God's law, neither indeed can it be. 
Because the whole attitude is, let me get what I need for myself, whether he wants me to have it or not, and let me get it apart from him so he has no control of it. And that's that carnal self-confidence that Jesus has died to destroy. That's his love, loved ones. He has experienced the worst of your independence and your pride and your self-dependence. He's taken it into himself and destroyed it there. Now, that is not popular Christianity. That's not what popular Christianity teaches. Popular Christianity teaches that Jesus died for us so that we could go on doing what we cannot stop doing, sin. But now we will do it like everybody else, but we'll do it now with immunity because Jesus has died for us. Popular Christianity says, Jesus died for us so that we don't have to die at all. You can carry on just the way you're doing, but now you won't be punished for it. Now, loved ones, that's not real Christianity. Real Christianity is what Second Corinthians says. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might continue to sin with immunity? No, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And the whole purpose of Calvary is to deal with that perverted, self-carnal personality of yours that continues to want to live without God. And that's what Calvary is all about. And that's what the love of Christ is all about. And so really what's happening this morning, you know, is Jesus loves you so much that he is trying to get that death embrace round some part of your life. That's it. He's trying to get that death embrace round some part of your life. He's trying to embrace you and draw you up onto his cross where you, like him, are crucified to the world. He didn't use the martinis to deal with the worry or anxiety. He didn't use the nicotine to try to quieten himself down when he was nerved up. He didn't use the television to kind of dull his brain to the troubles around him. He wants you to join him in that death to using external substitutes for real trust and faith in your Father who made you. And what he's involved in doing now is trying to lovingly draw you into that embrace and draw you onto the cross. And that's what it's all about. Now, loved ones, that's what makes sense of the verse that we're studying today. And maybe you'd like to look at it. It's Romans 8 and verse 35. Romans 8 and verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Now, the love of Christ is Jesus trying to draw us into his own death to using the world instead of God as our Father and as the supplier of all our needs. Now, loved ones, what really happens is all these things draw us nearer to the love of Christ. They don't separate us from the love of Christ. They draw us nearer to them. Because do you see, all of these things are determined to destroy our existence. Look at it right from the last one, you see, the sword. That's death itself. Peril is, well, danger of life or danger of death. Nakedness is the exposure of our bodies, which would eventually bring death. Famine is lack of sustenance for the body, which would eventually bring death. Persecution is the persistent attempts of other people to destroy us. Distress is some difficulty that we might come into that begins to bring strain into our lives. Tribulation is the kind of pressures that we meet in this life that begin to make us less ad- feel less adequate than we really are ourselves. Now, each of those are increasing degrees of death and destruction of our old selves. And each one of those have the effect of drawing us nearer to Jesus. 
So let's take an example. The very first one, I can't take them all, but the first one is tribulation. And the Greek word is phlipsis. And that really means a feeling of pressure. So the finances are beginning to fray at the edges. Okay? You've taken on one payment too much. And you're beginning to worry about the late charges. And you're beginning to sense I don't have the thing in control. And the last car I really shouldn't have bought. And you're beginning to have that feeling of pressure that is spoiling life. You know, the, you know that you just lose the freedom and the joy of it and you begin to have trouble getting to sleep at night. And you're waking up in the morning and you're still thinking of how you haven't paid that last bill. Now, a feeling of pressure like that. Or many of us have had the experience in work, you remember, where uh, the job doesn't seem as secure as it used to seem. It just doesn't seem as secure as it used to seem. And we begin to worry when we come home at night and you begin to experience a feeling of pressure. And that just grows and grows and you begin to sense, boy, it's spoiling all of life. And it can easily become, actually, it can be easily become the next word, uh, distress. Stenachoria is a narrowness where you're being narrowed in and you, find, you feel you're being driven back into a corner. I'm getting into a financial corner or a professional corner. I I don't quite know which way to turn. Now, the reason you feel the pressure is because you really long ago have taken over the management of your own finances. The reason you're in this mess at all is you made some decisions that were not given to God at all. And you didn't refer to him at all about them. But uh, whatever it is, you've begun to take the thing over yourself. And you're beginning to manage your financial life. And so when it begins to come uh, fraying at the edges, you feel, it's my responsibility. I got myself into it. It's mine. And I have to do what I can to rectify it. And you know what happens in that situation. The self just intensifies. In fact, some of us have found a real almost suicidal self-destructive tendency. We, we will not sell the car. We won't sell it. We won't sell the last thing. No, it would be an admission that we're lacking in self-confidence or we're failing in competence. And we just seem to hold on all the tighter. You know, it's almost as if the car is on its way over the cliff and the further it goes, the harder we hold on to the steering wheel. Or it's the same with the job situation. We find the job is is not as secure as we thought it was. And uh, we feel it slipping out of our grasp. And what do we do? You know what we do. We intensify our efforts all the more. You know, We try, try to grow more subtle in the way we get one up on the other fellow in the office. Or we work harder. Or we work longer hours. But we do everything to hold on to that thing. But loved ones, our whole response, our whole reaction shows we're going to keep these things whatever. Whether God wants us to have them or not, I'm going to hold on to them. I'm going to hold on to them. Now, loved ones, the love of Christ is acting in every pressure situation, saying to you, my child, will you come on to the cross with me? Will you die to the financial situation? Will you die to your need for that last car or that last coat? Let it go. What does it matter? In 20 years, you won't know whether you had it or not. Die to your job situation. Die to your control of that job. Let me take care of the job. Let me give you the job I want. Let me let, allow you to be demoted completely till you're little more than an office boy or an office girl. Let me have my way in your life. Be prepared to join me on the cross. I became a nothing. I became a nothing. I became a criminal in everybody's eyes for you. Now join me on that cross. Will you relax and forget what everybody else thinks you should do and turn from this self-managing of your life that you're engaged in and join me on the cross and die to this carnal, self-confident desire to run your life apart from God by all other kinds of substitutes. Now, loved ones, in every pressure situation, whether it be tribulation or distress 
or whether it be people out to get you and to destroy you, your Savior is trying to use that to draw you onto his cross, to draw you out of some self-managing of your life that you've begun to develop. See, all strain and all unrest and all discontent comes from you wanting something that your Father in heaven doesn't want you to have at that moment. And that you won't get. Or if you get it, it'll turn to ashes in your hands. All unrest and strain and discontent comes from you wanting something that your Creator doesn't want you to have at this moment. Every time you back off from that attitude and join Jesus on the cross, there comes a sense of peace and rest and an absolute contentment, whatever the Father has given me, that I'm happy with. That was Jesus' attitude, you remember. Judas, you remember, whoever dips the sop with me, he's the one who will betray me. Judas dipped the sop. He got up. To go out, all the rest thought he was going out to do something with the money. Jesus knew, and he said, What thou doest, do quickly. Now that was Jesus' attitude. All right, if God has allowed this to happen, I cooperate with it. Thank you, Father. It's in your hands. Now, come back here, Judas, and stay. But, Lord, it's in your hands. Judas is going to do what my Father is allowing him to do. I accept it. And yet, in no way was he fatalistic or pacifist. Because Jesus was very active on others' behalf and very active on God's behalf. So, loved ones, it's a dying to taking care of yourself and a coming alive to caring only for God and for other people. And that's what Jesus is trying to draw you into every time strain or tribulation comes. So far from those things separating you from the love of Christ, they actually are a method that the love of Jesus uses to bring you onto the cross. Do you doubt it? Then when were you last closest to God? When did you last feel closest to God? You know there isn't one of us here who would not say, either when my dad died or when I saw my job disappearing out from under me or when the house burned down or when my wife was going to die or we'd all refer to some hideous disaster that was outside our control. Now, loved ones, what we need to see is all these disasters are being used by Jesus and by his love not sent by him, but being used by him to try to draw us out of this self-management of our own lives. And that's really what he's trying to do. So, you know, each one of you will see it differently. And only the Holy Spirit can show you. But what God is after is that old independent self of yours. And that's why Jesus died. And that's where deliverance comes. Let us pray. Dear Father, we would confess uh, that a thousand times we have just taken the thing into our own hands. Lord, a thousand times we've reached for the martini or the cigarette or reached for the television set or gone out for a walk, anything to get away from the trouble or the problem or the worry or the anxiety. Lord, a thousand times we've seen other people just about to take our job out of our hands and we've risen up not questioning whether it was your will or not, but just determined that we weren't going to lose our end of the thing. And Lord, we see that it's completely opposed to Jesus' way. We see, Father, that it's often that self-assertion that we produce that causes all the trouble in our homes, that same self-assertion that creates the arguments and the disagreements with our loved ones. So, Lord, we do see that this personality of ours is just trained in an animal-like kind of self-defense, self-preservation technique that wants to run our lives the way we want them to without reference to you. Lord, we see that that's not the way you meant us to live. We see, Lord, that 
There are little sparrows that shouldn't be alive at all. They should be destroyed by all the stronger birds. There are little animals that shouldn't be alive in your world. By survival of the fittest, they wouldn't be alive at all. And yet, Lord, you preserve them. Even the sparrows can't fall to the ground without you seeing them. So we see, our Father, that there are a thousand examples in life of your preserving the lives of those who depend upon you and who have no other defense. So, dear Father, we see that our lives, too, are meant to be lived like that. And we're meant to join our dear Savior on the cross and allow you to destroy in him this carnal self-confidence and self-assertion and commit our lives into your hands and begin to rest in you instead of other substitutes and other saviors. Dear Father, I trust you for any brother or sister here this morning who knows that they just need to sigh a deep sigh and commit this whole thing into your hands and stop threshing around and trying to get their own way by their own power. Lord, if there is a brother or sister here who has been involved in government of the self, by the self, for the self, will you enable them to see that that leads to destruction, that there can only be one God in your universe, and that's you and that you have a plan for each one of our lives. And all you want us to do is let you show it to us and bring it about. So, dear Father, we would pray for each other this morning. Pray for everybody who is in the midst of a pressure situation, everybody who is in tribulation or distress this morning. And, Lord, will you show them that they're in it because they're trying to be the ringmasters. They're trying to run the whole circus. They're trying to be God. And you want them to give up and to trust you. I trust you, Holy Spirit, that you will express the love of Jesus to every one of us this morning as he lovingly draws us into his death embrace on the cross so that we may experience that resurrection life that treats our Creator as our Father, one who can be trusted, can be depended upon. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God 